Network error. Don't network error me. Not the Bud Light one. It actually tastes amazing. Okay. All right, Devin, talk. <laughs> I'm going to talk. Everybody should be okay, able to hear. Perfect. It's we can hear everyone on Twitch. So we are good to go there. Oh, dang it. Going to the mod view. Sorry. One second. Why is this not giving me chat, Devin? It's Murphy's Law. If it Could, can't go wrong, couldn't it tell you. Go wrong. <laughs> right after we go live is when it all goes wrong. Yep. Um, so my oh. printer exploded this morning, and I had to go run out and get a new printer. Ooh. And um, apparently everybody's setting up their home office because <laughs> there was like one printer in all of the stores. You should try and buy ink for, uh, you know, because we have seven trucks that use printers on their trucks. And uh -huh. trying to buy ink is, I mean, good luck. <laughs> Luck. They're like, you can buy two, and we'll give it to you next month. What? <laughs> oh, seriously, they're rationing ink. Oh yeah, I don't know who's oh, making it, but uh, yeah. And I've gotten, uh, I ordered, I tried to order through Staples. Amazon was the only person, only place I could get two from. Everywhere else, I would order them. They're like, yeah, we have it, and then I order it, and then they send me an email the next day. I'm sorry, we cannot complete your order. We will refund you. I'm like, what? <laughs> oh man. That's okay, worst. perfect. It's working now. You should cut mm -hmm. up a bunch of ballpoint pens and just kind of pour the ink <laughs> into the reservoir. See if that I don't. Works. I don't think that's how it works. <laughs> it could. Ink is ink, right? Yeah. No, that's not how it works. <laughs> All right. Um. Here we go. I am ready to go live in four, three. Oh, we were live. <laughs> you are listening to the Freelancer Codex, a podcast brought to you by the Shut Up and Respawn Network. Welcome everybody to episode one hundred. It does get loud. You gotta get ready for it. Welcome everybody to episode one hundred twenty-two of the Freelancer Codex podcast. I am your host Steve, along with my co-host Devin and Mike, and we are also joined today with a very special guest, Greg Kasavin of Super Giant Games. Greg, how are you? Doing, doing. I was gonna say doing well. Doing all right. Hanging in there. Uh, thanks for yeah. having me on the show. No, we are, we are we are glad to have you. We have I've been playing Super Giant Games since Bastion released, um, and not to like fanboy out at all, but Bastion is one of the games that actually like put me on the path that I'm currently on now. Because when you guys announced at E3, I forget was was it 2010 yeah. E3 when you announced? Well, um, we were we were at the 2011 E3. Uh, 2010 is when we first showed the game. Okay. At PAX, but yeah, it, it would have been 2011. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it was one of those moments where you see a game and you're like, it just kind of blew me away. I don't know if it's because it put off, for me, it gave me um, Legend of Zelda vibes. Yeah. Just from the view and the colors, the, uh, the artwork from Jen is amazing. And I think that just kind of stuck with me. And it was one of those moments where you're like, wow, yep, this is why I love video games because there's people creating games like this. So, Thanks for making Bastion, you and the team. Um, and it's something that it even drove me to, I, I found this old picture that I tweeted out to the team after I saw the Bastion reveal. I cut up an old case for the Xbox 360 that I had laying around. Yeah. And I'm like, I need to make, I need to turn this into something Bastion related. And it was just kind of a fun step down memory lane for me to, uh, thinking about Bastion. I'm sure it's the same for you anytime someone talks about Bastion. Did you yeah, show that picture I mean, to us? It's actually on the, it, the document. Oh, okay. Didn't you bring that case mod like two packs? Am I imagining that? Because I definitely saw it. I don't remember if you were there in person or not. Like at No, I, I think I, I tweeted that out to you guys. I, okay. I was not at PAX, but I tweeted it out. I was like, hey, guys, check this out. And I was like, hey, they oh, responded. Yeah. So, and then, no, it was super. I mean, I definitely remember it. Uh, the Yeah, I mean, hey, Bastion's the reason that we're still able to do what we're doing. It's it, we're, we're just the... Our team is, it was just seven people at the time. It's like 10 years ago. And we've grown, a, we grew, you know, relatively for, for Hades in particular, but we, we went from seven to 12 and now we're, we're closer to 20 on Hades, but we're still fewer than 20 people after all this time. Um, so it's like, uh, we just work on one game to the next. And if, if not for Bastion, we couldn't have made Transistor and, and on and on. So yeah, it's, it, it's very near and dear to my heart still and and we 
I, I think I speak for all of us that we're really grateful that uh, people still remember it fondly. It's one of those things. It's like, even if you're lucky enough to work on a game that people think is worth a damn at the time, you never really know what like the hindsight on a game is going to be. I'm sure you could think of games where like people were super excited about them when they first came out, but like whether weeks or months or even years later, sometimes the hindsight on them just kind of sours for whatever weird reason. Um, but Bastion still seems to be relatively well regarded by people and like, thank, thank goodness for that. So now we just try to make stuff that lives up to it. Yep. And I, and so far I think you have, sorry, it sounds like a fire engine is driving outside of my house right now. Um, <laughs> but one thing that we kind of wanted to jump in and talk to you about Greg, like, like, first of all, how, how is the team handling the, the isolation? <laughs> all this? Yeah. yeah. Um, we're we're handling it. Um, I think as I, I I dare say as as well as could be expected. I think uh, because si since we are uh, a small team, we've always like remote work has always been part of how we do things. Um, uh, uh, Logan Cunningham, our our voice actor, who's the narrator in Bastion and has played a principal character in all of our games, uh, he's he's been off in New York this whole time, whereas we're based in the uh, Bay Area all the way across the country. Um, and we have other folks um, living in different places and stuff like that. So we've been working remotely since the basically since early March. So it's actually two months now, because um, we we kind of got in on it pretty early. Uh, the first moment when uh, there was word of uh, so-called community spread in San Francisco, when there was a report of like, hey, uh, someone got this thing and they haven't traveled and. They don't really know where they got it from. We're like, all right, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're just going to work from home, be, you know, because we could, right? It, it wasn't a difficult transition for us uh, overall. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's still like on a, on a personal level, it, it can vary quite a bit from uh, from person to person, of course. You know, those of us with kids and stuff, it's different considerations. And I'm sure it's really different, you know, if, you, if you're – living with your family as opposed to with roommates or on your own like all those things i think make circumstances really really different um but i i count my lucky stars uh in a weird way i like i actually get to see my family more than than i would otherwise so it's it's weird to find any silver lining in this and you know you wouldn't you would you would definitely if someone said would you just if you could wave a magic wand and prevent all this from happening, you would wave that wand right away. You you wouldn't take uh, right, uh, but but um, it's that there's any silver lining in it whatsoever is is kind of bizarre to me. But yeah, I'll, I'll yeah. try to. But, but it. I also think it. I also think it's important that we. You know, you kind of have to look for the positives, or else it's I, you know it's, it's so negative all the time. And a lot of times we always have to say we know everything's bad. We know that people have been widely affected by it. But it's it's also good to notice, you know, the positive and the things that the good things that people are doing and the good things that are happening. So, you know, being able to see your family, that that's awesome, because I know that a lot of times when you're in development, I mean, you're at the office for, you know, for long, long hours and you don't get to see the family. So this is one of those things that I, I'm glad that you get to spend more time with them. Are your so are your kids dealing with with the quarantine? Well, or I guess my question is, what games are they playing during quarantine? <laughs> Yeah, well, it's uh, it's a uh, probably not a surprising answer, but there's been a lot of uh, Animal Crossing going on over here. It's actually kind of like uh, contributing to the bizarro land circumstances. Like I, you know, I was always the one who played games like kind of just nonstop. But it's weird. Like I, I almost never used the Nintendo. Like everyone else in my family used the Nintendo Switch. I like never use it myself anymore because they're all on it which is which is like it makes me laugh as you can see because it's just uh it's just funny to me like my my wife is not not normally into games at all but um the original animal crossing was or or actually it was uh, animal crossing for the ds was like one of the games that did like uh, capture that she got into at the time so it's been cool to see her getting into it as well and we could all be on the same island that sort of thing and for um I played through uh, Streets of Rage four with my son and stuff like that, and that was that was cool. Um, yeah, so I mean, I'm grateful that there's been a bunch of bunch of good games despite everything. Like uh, played through Final Fantasy seven remake. That's kind of the last kind of big game that I 
uh, played through start to finish, but I'm always messing around with some stuff here and there. Yeah, very cool. And I, I am I am very surprised how Animal Crossing just kind of, I think we all knew the game was going to do well because it has its following, but yeah. man, the game blew up. I mean, Debbie, your <laughs> wife, has even talked about picking up Animal Crossing. And she no, she's, she's not talked about picking up Animal Crossing. <laughs> <laughs> no, she she but. did ask me about a couple Switch games, and I was like, well, what? Because my wife doesn't play video games. So I was like, what are you, what? Hold on here. What happened? <laughs> yeah, what's going on? Why are you asking about games? <laughs> so one thing, Greg, I, I have always wanted to ask you guys about, and this is this is something, I'll play the audio, um, because we are mainly a podcast, but I wanted to ask if this is, like, if this is the most important thing you've ever been involved with. So hopefully you guys can hear this and it comes through on audio. You had no job. If you were druid, then you got to steal that life of barbarian, then I got to hear. So bind those keys. You were the drummer for bind no. those keys. I, I, can, I can take no credit for I, I was not the drummer. Um, and I'm not just saying that. I, I, would, I would proudly... <laughs> uh, take ownership if I actually honestly had anything to do with it but but um but that's uh, uh my colleague Amir Rao uh who's uh one of the co-founders of Supergiant uh that is that is his uh brainchild I believe and Darren Korb our audio director um is there with him and uh and and others uh close to close to Amir but that Amir uh Produ- you know wrote uh, directed and produced uh, dare i say that that um that video while we were working i think it was like over a christmas break while we were working at electronic arts so it was like the year it was basically the same year supergiant was founded so just a few months before uh, supergiant started but but i personally uh, am not in in the mix uh, i'm sad to say as much as I would, yeah, love to love to take credit for that. So, I love so Diablo the too. That, <laughs> yeah. It's a tribute that, to Diablo too. Yeah, and it, I think everyone should go. I'll, I will put the link to the YouTube video in the show notes so everyone can go check this out. But the one thing that I, for some reason, I always go back to this video because, like, reading the comments, I don't normally read YouTube comments. But there's like so much positivity for Super Giant just reading through the comments on this video for people like, I can't believe this team did this. This is so awesome. I will love this team for forever. Like, I want to work here. Like, I, and I think it's things like this that indie studios can do that sometimes like big budget AAA titles, they're just not, they don't have the freedom to put themselves out there and to try yeah. things like this. And like, I think it's a testament to your team that you're able to do this stuff and it creates a following of fans that are like, hey, we'll follow Supergiant everywhere. So when you guys put out Transistor on PlayStation, I didn't own a PlayStation at the time, but I purchased the game because I was like, oh, I've got to support this team because I love what they do. And I think it's, you know, stuff like this that really helps, you know, build a fan base. And I know you guys have been doing the no clip documentary. And you've had that series. You did one. You did a portion of it for Pyre, and I think Noclips has been with you guys for the entire duration of of Hades. Is that correct? Since uh, since before we announced the game, uh, basically we were less than a year, or maybe like eight months into development or something like that when when Noclip first started uh, filming stuff with us on Hades. Yeah, which is pretty so, cool because yeah, now it's like now we're you know two and a half years in development or something like that. So it's been a good chunk of time. So so first question, I guess, is why do you let someone in to record your entire development process? It sounds like yeah. an, an insane thing that someone would do to let, you know, to have cameras recording all the time. Yeah, the, so I mean, I think for me personally, it partly goes back to some of my background because um, I used to work in the gaming press before I got into game development. Um, uh, I worked at GameSpot for 10 years, um, starting in, as an intern, kind of only only some months out of high school. And I ended up there way longer than I would have expected and was editor-in-chief by the end. Um, and I really loved uh, working there, but I always wanted to make games since I was a little kid. So it was one of those things where one day I, uh, I just felt a real urgency to at least uh, try my hand at that. But back to my... I've always been interested in how games are actually made, you know, even when I was on the outside of the process. So now that I'm on the inside of the process, I'm still interested in those stories being told. And I'm like, th- there are those stories being told now, thankfully, um, by, by folks like Noclip um, 
Um, but but um, you know, to the extent that I can contribute to that process, I would love to do that. Um, showing more of the kind of reality of it, and some of the I think like some of the mundane details are can be some of the most interesting ones, even if they seem boring on the surface. Like we we watch a fair amount of there's like a fair amount of kind of reality shows that we would watch in my household here, and they're they're about everything, right? They're about like making cupcakes and real estate and all the stuff that's like, man, you can't tell me that game development is like a less interesting subject than like making <laughs> cupcakes. No offense to cupcake. Making. <laughs> like at the very, at the very least, it's like comparable. Right. So <laughs> yeah. there have to be interesting stories to tell there. Um, and, and I, from my GameSpot days, yeah, it's like, you just hear only about the successes of games so that you don't really you, you you occasionally get these like exposés about you know the the rough like working conditions or something like that but you just it, it, it's so hard to get a sense of like the actual day to day and how people interact and work um so i i we we welcomed being kind of a guinea pig for something like that in no clip and it's one of those things it's like you take a gamble on it right like you you hopefully hopefully you don't come out of it looking like total jackasses but that's a risk you take you're not you're hopefully not doing it to like posture for the camera you're just trying to be real and show how you, you know how it's really done but my, my my feeling i'm not too i'm not too afraid of it because my my general feeling is if you have a group of people who like really care about what they're doing and and are like their their motivations are coming from a pure place and you don't really have anything you don't have too much to be worried about um when it comes to someone filming you it, unless they're going to go in, yeah, they're they're just going to show you doing your thing, and if if you care about what you're doing, it's going to come across. Yeah, right. And I I have been disappointed that there have been no chairs thrown it, from at least from what they <laughs> yeah. put out there. We're we're pretty. That's the other thing. We're like pretty. I don't know. We're not uh, buying those keys. I think makes us out to be. Our our games have like a. I think we channel our personalities into. <laughs> are, are like sort of his secret personalities into our game i don't know so i shouldn't speak for everyone uh, I, i'm speaking only for myself i'm like super i'm super super like just boring as a as a person as a, it's much more <laughs> what goes on in my imagination is much more interesting than kind of what goes on in, in my life uh for real so that's the other part of it yeah no no chairs thrown it's like we have our creative differences for sure but i i've never you hear some of those like horror stories in the game industry of like people putting their fists through i don't know how many of these stories are out there actually but i i've heard of stories of people like you know putting their fists through walls like things getting like that that heated and i've never i've been in the game industry for like 20 years now between GameSpot and super giant never i've never seen any i've never personally paid witness to anything that like explosive it's and there's no kind of uh real housewives level uh drama that i've personally experienced not to say it doesn't happen just just for me well one thing i really enjoyed from watching the documentaries i think there there's one there's one i forget what video it was but amir was um talking on camera and then he found out that he was wearing the exact same sweater that he <laughs> wore a year previously and I was like, I started to cry a little bit because Mike makes fun of me when I wear the same shirt on the podcast <laughs> over and over again. I have, a, I, have a very, I have a favorite hoodie that I wear. He's like, you can't wear the same hoodie over and over again. So I, I had a connection with Amir when he was um, when he was wearing the same sweater. Yeah. Do you, so do you think that, like, do you think that it has affected, like, the personnel just having the camera around? Or do you think it's just kind of, nope, it's business as usual, or professionals, like, they're just another part of the team, I guess. At yeah, that no, we we've definitely like we've set our kind of I I I think people are handling it well. Like we don't we're not we're careful not to be like invasive about it with people for whom it may be a negative experience. Mm -hmm. So it's not if someone's like heads down, you know, grinding on their stuff, we're not going to like the, like the no clip guys are very they're very respectful and really good at like being a, a fly on the wall. Um, and and we actually do some of the filming ourselves uh, one of our guys john paul uh he he films a lot of day-to-day -day stuff um and then sends the footage over to them um and and so i think we're just pretty used to seeing the camera roll at this point we know when to turn it on we know when to turn it off we we turn it off mostly for not for like interesting stuff we turn it off for like boring like business stuff 
where it's just yeah. kind of inappropriate with like talking about your bank account or something it's just like it's neither here nor there um but other than that like when it's design meetings and what have you we're 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 pretty happy to just let it play out um cool yeah so so then bastion's gonna it's coming up on its 10 year anniversary it'll be next year sometime yeah it'll be yeah it'll be in Ooh. yeah 2011 in july September. july September? Um, or somewhere yeah july there. july 20th was was uh the day bastion came out um so, yeah so and super giant turned 10 last year so yeah, the, the suit itself yeah 10. thank you yeah so this like, bastion is almost 10 years old 11 more years and you guys can start drinking like yeah almost there but um like I guess we all see the trend right now in the video game industry. It's that remake, remaster, revive everything. Like Bastion remastered in the future, Bastion 2 in the future. I know you guys are working on Hades now, but like that's the thing, right? Remaster all the things. And I've, I've always found it admirable that your team has put out four brand new IPs and successful IPs that any other studio would be like, guys, we could just make Bastion 2 and yeah. we could get a contract, right? Or we could get funding to continue developing. But you guys are like, no, we're gonna make something different. So why go against like the sure thing and like say, hey, let's just try this. Yeah, th that was definitely like, that was a key moment after Bastion because I think like, I think conventional wisdom at that point, considering the game, like the game, the game's success wasn't overnight, but it was like, it just kind of didn't, it didn't stop being it didn't like stop selling basically in a way that you would expect like an eight hour long game with no traditional replay value to it, games like that you know they sell for a couple of weeks and then that's it um maybe there's a sale or something but uh bastion just kind of kept going so a couple of months after it came out we're like dude this game this game appears to be a success and we seem to be able to stick around as a team and go make something else. We were all, we loved uh, working on Bastion and we loved the game itself, uh, but we had also kind of lived and breathed Bastion for a while. Um, so we were, yeah, it, it, like it, it might've been the wise choice just to like go make another Bastion game, but it wasn't what we were like. We weren't excited to make more Bastion right away at that point, and and instead we were much more interested in seeing, can we do this again? Like, are we are we a one hit wonder, or can or was this like a flash in the pan, or do we think we have what it takes to like create something like this but but different? Um, and that's that's kind of how Transistor started our attempt to just see if we could make something that stood on its own two feet, um, and. The, the same as Bastion without like being in its shadow. Um, and we've kind of, but but there's nothing, I think some people think that we have some kind of like moral code, like we will never do a sequel or something like that. Like, <laughs> it's not that, it's not that like hardcore, it, that's never been a consideration. It's always just been that we've been more excited to do something else. Um, but we, we only plan one game ahead, uh, at least up until this point. Um, and we don't, especially now, uh, I, I don't know any better than anyone else what the future holds. So I know that for now we have, uh, like, we're going to be working on Hades uh, all this year, certainly. And we, um, and we're still figuring out what it's, uh, what that means for us, like long-term. Um, but it's a game that potentially has you know it, 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 people we've gotten a lot of good feedback about it people want to see us keep working on it so we have to see <laughs> what we do about that basically yeah and and i and I, i'll be honest greg i'm surprised that you haven't done a fighting game yet of the four games how have you not done a fighting <laughs> game with your background because it seems like you'd be like fighting game card game mash them together super giant magic on there i mean that's all it is right it's you sprinkle the magic and boom you've got a hit yeah you know yeah get some <clears throat> gen z uh, artwork and Dar darren korb uh, music in there and that can certainly make just about any game better i think uh but um it's not you know our games are highly they're they're like so collaborative in the design of them that i actually said this 
um, it's on the Pyre documentary with no clip that came out somewhat recently, but it's like, we, I don't think any of the games we've made are the game that any one person at Supergiant would be like, this is the game. Like they're all, which is weird to say because it makes it sound like they're like deeply compromised in some way, but it's, it's really, that's like a, that's like a negative way of looking at it. It's more that they're just a, it's just a very symbiotic process and that they take like it, like everybody is personally invested in them in different ways. So they kind of take on, I think some of the secret sauce such as it is comes from that where there's um, they just get shaped by the individuals who work on them quite a bit. But as a result, they don't really fall into super traditional categories. So like, I, I love fighting games personally, but it's not the cup of tea of all my colleagues. So it's like, I, I personally don't see it as something that we would that we would do necessarily for that reason like something like pyre that's our fighting game but yeah. <laughs> you know other people called it like a visual novel sports game or whatever so <laughs> yeah they they our, our developments can take strange turns in that way but fighting games have influenced everything i've worked on that's for sure and and i think like watching the no clip documentary and um because i think it's so well done it really did show that collaborative process that your team has I think I remember one time you guys were talking about making um, whenever you equip Exegriff in Hades, you could float around. Yeah. And the uh, and I, I started yelling at my phone at that time because I was watching on my phone. It's like, don't you make Zagreus float around? It looks ridiculous. Right? <laughs> like, you better not make that decision. And I was like, I know you had it because it was already in the game at that point. But it's like, it seems like it's like, hey, you know, it, it, it very much is a team because a lot of times you hear about studios where there's a head and those are where the decisions come from and you just kind of follow follow along but yeah. it, it's very cool that you guys have that open you know communication especially because you know it seems to work out for your team very well so i hope you yeah. don't change that at all no i mean i i think as so long as it's like all seven of the people who were there uh for bastion we're all still there in our respective roles and like as long as we stick together like that i just imagine it's going to kind of stay that way we're all we're all pretty different in our in our dispositions and and personalities and and I think but I think it's like there there's a yeah it's it's a group of people where we're not someone's going to speak up if they if they don't like where something's going or something like that it's not it's not just like it can be really easy when you just kind of have your way in those kind of situations and and when I when I occasionally have that it actually makes me super nervous like when I'm it, it happens to me when I'm working on story stuff, when I'm, when it's just going so fast that like no one's reviewing it really. I'm yeah. like, man, this is, this has to slow down. Like I, it needs, it needs feedback. It needs vetting because you don't want to, you don't want to kind of crawl up your own butt as it were. You, you need to make sure you're making games, not for yourself, but for uh, your players. And you need to make sure that you're like, that your decisions um, make, make sense to so that, that whatever, excitement that you feel uh that that someone else can at least see how that might be worth trying <laughs> um, right uh, and um when it's a small group of people um and i i think we're at a good size where i like to say you know the more like the, the more people you have like the more people you have involved in something the more people you have who can say no there's always a there's always like a very sensible and rational reason to say no to just about anything. The more people you ask, eventually someone's going to be, give you a very good reason why you shouldn't do what you want to do. Right. Yeah. Um, so not having, just having like a group of trusted people who are, are, have, you know, have some like risk tolerance, right. They're like, okay, maybe this isn't what I do, but I see that you're super excited about this and man, you know what, if you think you can do it, go for it. We'll see how it goes. These are my concerns, but if you want to do it, knock yourself out um we those are like types of exchanges we have sometimes we talk each other out of things sometimes we encourage uh, each other to do stuff and i i've come to the thing i've come to look for most of all is just um the i just look for what my colleagues are like excited to do i just try to do that thing so that's why yeah. i don't push for a fighting game anymore like i might be excited about a fighting game but i can't make a damn thing myself um I, I want to find the idea that the largest number of my colleagues are like the most excited about. And in the case of Hades, that's like, that was the idea where the most people were like, oh, dude, yeah, sorry, dog barking. The most people no at Supergiant were like, oh man, 
that sounds exciting. I know what my part in that would be. I want to start working on that. All right, let's do it. Let's start working on it. And because all you have is when you're working on games, it's like so much of like a lot of the process just isn't fun. It's, it can be really sluggy. It can be like grindy, like in games, when you're grinding, it's like a similar fe feeling in game development, just kind of grinding through the stuff that's like not particularly fun, but has to get done. So your excitement is like really all that's going to carry you through that and if you're not if you're not excited about the thing you're making the player is like really going to tell on the other side i think you could just tell when you play a game that like the developers made were like really fired up about versus not fired up about it because those are the games that have like a bunch of little details that didn't need to be there um i and i think i think those little details are like what make games really special what what make the really special games really stand out the the dumb stuff that you know no one in their right mind should have done but they did it anyway you're like oh my god i can't believe this game is doing this thing right they they, they go the extra step yeah in in all oh. kinds of surprising ways yeah so talking about hades now greg i i would like like why greek mythology um like is there do you have like some affinity for the greek mythology that you know you yeah. wanted to spend time there yeah, I, I do personally, and, and again, that's true of uh, several of my colleagues um, as well. Um, it's something I have uh, loved since I was like six or something like that. Basically, probably for about as long as I've been, enjoyed games, I've always had an interest in it, uh, both just like personally and uh, at, the, at the college level and stuff like that. It's just always been fascinated with uh, the the works of Homer and the, these kind of like the classics and stuff like that. And I've always had like a personal frustration. Like I love, uh, I, I like modern media inspired by Greek myth. Like it, you know, grew up with Clash of the Titans and whatnot, the, the old, the old version. Um, but I've always had this kind of nagging feeling that like, man, there, there's, there's this really big gap between the, the source material and, and kind of modern renditions of Greek myth. Um, like for example, Zeus who everyone knows is rendered usually he's he's almost conflated with like biblical god he's like a big benevolent right you know like like he like i will i will i will do good for humankind kind of guy but in the source myth zeus is zeus is like a super villain esque he's like responsible for probably more atrocities than any other uh, greek god and many of them are responsible for a great number of atrocities indeed uh, zeus is just like He's a fascinating character because he's all about like totally unchecked power. So I think of him more as almost like a, almost like a crime boss, um, just just totally no consequences for any of his actions. Because who's going to stop him? He's 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 the god of gods. Um, so right. I find that super fascinating, and just in general that that the you know I think I think you th you ask yourself it's like why th these stories are thousands of years old. Um, why are they still remembered? There must be something there. And I think at the heart of it is that it's two things. One is that th these gods are compelling, like, because they're, like, because they're human qualities. It's not because they throw, like, sick thunderbolts or make tidal waves or whatever. It's because they're super flawed and messed up and, and you know, do terrible things. Um, and the other is that they're the ultimate dysfunctional family. Um, like, you can always compare whatever weirdnesses or bad stuff in, in any given family to what uh, to the to the Greek gods. And I think that's like what makes them so universally compelling. And that that angle, like like seeing them as a family was was for us the thing that made us want to make this game. We're like, what can we contribute, right? Like Greek myth is kind of overdone. Um, so we we're not gonna do something in that sort of genre unless we have a point of view on it that we don't think has been done to death and the idea that they're a big dysfunctional family in particular and sort of casting all the characters as different family archetypes that was compelling to us and it, it, it was it was the image of uh cerberus as the family dog that was like the thing that really crystallized it for us like both the kind of humor and just the 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 direction of it of like okay yeah it, it, cerberus is this you know feared hound of hell but in the house of hades he's just the family dog um, and yeah. and your dad your dad is gonna chew you out when you like try to escape from run away from home and fail and all this stuff. So it was funny to us and seemed interesting to explore, and that's that's why we started pursuing it. 
And, and thank you for letting us pet Cerberus. Um, yeah, yeah. I think that's one of the most important things you guys have added to the game. You've got to be able to is, pet him. It is important if you have a giant fiery <laughs> hellhound who's your pet, you damn well better uh, let people pet him. I agree. Yeah. So <laughs> go in with Zagreus as the main character because Zagreus wasn't a character that I was familiar with at all. No. Um, in nor, nor I. Nor I. So, was it just an opportunity to say, hey, not many people know about him, so we can kind of do whatever we want with him? Yeah, it was It was a couple of, like, basically as we were, we were, um, we had already sort of set on um, doing something in, in Greek myth. Like, the other aspect of it that was exciting to us was actually just, like, paradoxically that adapting something was new to us. We've made, like, three totally original, um, or totally original we've made three original uh game worlds uh prior to hades so for us the idea of like adapting something that already existed was like a new thing for us to try so that was it, um it was like more felt more new and more exciting than just to make another thing from scratch um and like in 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 looking at hades in particular which started to kind of draw our attention this idea of like a reverse diablo of like start at the bottom of hell and fight your way to the surface rather than the other way around. In in my researching of the source material, I, I found the you know there are these shreds of shreds of myth suggesting in in according to some uh, authors that Hades had a son uh, called called Zagreus and it's like what he had a son and there's like very little information about this guy. There's all this like bizarre some of the more common stuff about Zagreus is that like he was actually the the original version of Dionysus and all this kind of stuff that's like right. these wild stories that all almost don't make any sense but the idea that he had this son that no one knows about was like whoa that that's interesting why does no one know about him what happened there and also the other the other thing that was so fascinating was um Hades is one of those like kind of household names as far as Greek myth goes, right? You have like Zeus and Poseidon and Athena and Hades. He's up there as far as the most recognizable names, but there are very few actual myths about him. Um, and it turns out it's because the ancient Greeks were afraid of him. Like, don't don't talk smack about Hades. <laughs> you don't want to do that. And like, oh, that makes sense. Um, but the idea that we could kind of fill in some of those blanks, as it were, and like show a different side of the story. It, it was just really compelling. It gave us a, it gave us a blank slate, right? If yeah. we if we made the game about like Zeus or something like that, it's like, well, there are all these stories about Zeus. There are all these preconceptions about who he is or who he isn't or something like that. But with Zagreus, no one knows who this guy is. So he's ours to, he's ours to invent essentially, which is really helpful. Um, you know, when we're just trying to like develop a story and develop a game. Right. Did you also have a chance to read all the Percy Jackson fan fiction about Zagreus that's on the internet? I haven't read any. Uh, no, I haven't read that. I, I've read um, I've read the the Percy Jackson novels themselves. Um, that's that's interesting though. Yeah, I, I, I thought I, it was I funny that there was so much. But is it, what, is it by is it by like fans of Percy? It's not by uh, Rick Riordan, right? It's no, it, it's all it's all it's all fan fiction about fan him. Fiction. I just thought it was interesting. Yeah. Because I was researching Zagreus because I didn't know anything about him. And it's like, yeah. hey, Percy Jackson fan fiction. It's like, well, if this is the only fiction about Zagreus, I guess I better read it. And now I'm like 10, you know, 10 hours later, I've, I've stopped reading the Internet. But one of the things, Greg, that that I, I I tried to find like an NPC that you guys created that I'm like that I'm supposed to not like very much because there's always the NPC you're supposed to hate. But I'm like, I kind of like all the characters that you made. Like Hades is supposed to be this yeah. underworld hell bad guy. But like he runs his house, like he's got a pretty tight ship going on down there. Yeah. He's got all the all the souls are organized. They're all coming through the line. He's getting them to where they need to be. He's got his paperwork in order, and he just has this kid that's like, "Come on, just go clean your room. I've got hell to run over here. Just leave. you know." He's not a. He doesn't seem like a bad dad to me, but it's like, all right, Zach. Like maybe maybe he's you know maybe Zach is just going through a phase where he feels like he has to leave hell, but the interactions that you guys created between the different gods, like I, I really enjoy Artemis because her character yeah. type is like, she's not super confident, but she's a God. And she's like, Oh, well, I guess I can help you here. Like the way you've written all the characters and the way that their voice, I mean, really brings them to life in a way that is super impactful. It doesn't feel like any of the gods are throwaway. It feels like you put as much care into each one as the other. And I think there's, 
um shoot there's 29 we have yeah we we have like a i think it's an even 30 uh fully voiced character or one of them has is yet to be added but i think when all is said you and done tell us we'll that is here characters. now get us give us that exclusive <laughs> if you want but no. yeah like each yeah, character th thank you. is like and like I, I i geek out when i see him like when they interact with each other when they say hey i see you've got this from you know from yeah, athena yeah, yeah. and it's that those little touches that it's like oh the game knows what i what i have what i'm yep. doing and it's the small things that are like okay like it is a family they would know who you went to visit they would know that you have the mark of athena on you and they're like all right i guess here you go you can have this so like and you guys have always done characters well so it shouldn't be like a huge surprise that you just you know you created another 29 characters and gave them personality and that that shouldn't surprise me but it does because they're done so well um but one of the other characters that you know don't have a voice the weapons that zagreus uses in the game to fight through hell do you have a favorite weapon that that you use most of the time Ooh, um you know it's one of the we don't have it's one of those games where like there are so many different ways to use the weapons individually that there isn't like a huge total number of them there are six of them now we just uh added uh the the final one in a relatively recent update um i i guess geez i guess i might be partial to the to the good old blade just the sword that you start with but but i think it like maybe for nostalgic reasons because that's the one that that's like the first one that we made and we just like there there were we almost had him um start with a we considered having him start with a spear because the spear or, or actually the bident like the two-pronged spear is like hades's uh, signature weapon so it was like mm -hmm. oh his son should also fight with that um but but we liked the idea of him as like a sword as a sword user there's not it's that it has that directness in like a fantasy game you know you mentioned zelda earlier and stuff there's just something about a guy with the sword that tells you it's yeah. a, it's a fantasy game and and we want even though there's a lot of i think there's a quite a bit of quirky stuff in in hades um i think on the face of it at least we want we want it to be pretty clear what you're what you're getting yourself into but the the what you know just like the characters the weapons are the weapons are all very dear to me and i think i i'm i'm the type of player who like switches them up basically every single run yeah. I, I don't i tend to not go two runs in a row with the same weapon i'm not like i don't have like a main or whatever i don't i don't really think of myself that way even from fighting games and stuff i usually would would gravitate to multiple characters instead of like being super focused on only one devin was, so Devin's was the type of player answer. that <laughs> No, Devin's the type of player that just uses Ken all the time because he's got cheap moves. So he can't walk <laughs> hey, just because I'm not good with anybody else, Stephen. So, so well, Stephen and I better. would. That's exactly it, Greg. It's the type of place that you can't block. Well, so, hey, so... look, all right, when we're in a dark room, all right? <laughs> no, we played a lot of uh, Nintendo, Nintendo 3DS Street Fighter and got angry with one another multiple times. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of a lot of quiet drives home where you just don't talk to each other because you're upset. Like I hate you. <laughs> no, it's really bad. All so, pens, 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 yes, uh, yep. Punch. And then I I always had to go the route like, well, I'm using a real character that yeah. Yeah, 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 right, and then I just lose anyway. So, <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I'll take the high ground. <laughs> Even even like esports level fighting game players like have those kind of debates of like, mm. well. I play an honest character. I don't know about you. you yeah. know? <laughs> right. so, why you can't play Fox and Smash Brothers. So going going back to the weapon, sorry I derailed us. Yeah, yeah. Um so Aegis is my favorite. Um I think yeah, it's like sure. the, it's the weapon I used the first the first time I made my first clear, I used Aegis. And yeah. it's just it's fun throwing a shield around because you feel like Captain America. Yeah. Right. And and it uh, has that like it's like kind of the heaviest hitting. You just feel like you clobber guys so i like i like that aspect of it that it's like the hard hitting like yeah I mean, yeah and it, and it's nice because you guys built the, the game in a way that even if i want to use my main attack um there's upgrades for that or if i just want to throw it the the entire time yeah. there's upgrades for that so the the run is always different like you said i guess um 
so we just got Excalibur. One of the aspects for the sword is going to be Excalibur. Are we going to get like a Captain America limit a license for <laughs> Andy's sword? It's actually going to be a Cap Shield. You know, it's I I I would be lying if I said this was the first time that the idea uh, had been spoken. But I I Disney costs too much, know, right? I don't know if we're going to go quite that far uh, with it, but that would certainly be. It would certainly be funny um yeah the 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 thought of you, you know Ca captain america's shield actually from the old uh marvel ultimate alliance games uh which were like isometric action rpgs that kind of like hades it, it was a i think it was a specific inspiration um amir uh, who, who we talked about earlier uh, he's the guy who's like doing all the nuts and bolts uh tuning of our weapons and there was it was something like the shield was our most like out there weapon initially because it just did so many different things with this like boomerang throw and the ability to block and the ability to do this like big charging attack and stuff so it 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 um yeah and it's kind of i think it's like a favorite of a lot of people actually just because of yeah. its versatility and it's and it's really powerful also yeah it, it's definitely it's definitely my favorite I, i've been using the bow more recently after the yeah. after the update where demeter came in and she yeah. gave all her upgrades that changed the uh, the power of the bow a lot for me. So I use that a lot because there's some crazy combinations you can get with that where you use your special. And if you get up close to an enemy like the Hydra, you can just decimate a Hydra head in a couple of seconds. But that the Hades fight at the end kind of destroys destroys that strategy just because he's a punk to fight. You know, when you, you, when you go, up against, go up against your dad, he's just, you know. Are you giving out spoilers right now, Steven? What's going on? Um, <laughs> spoiler alert, Devin, you fight Hades in Hades. <laughs> hey, I'm just saying, know you know, people freak out. They're like, what are you telling me about this game? <laughs> you are, you are right. I, people, <clears throat> people are crazy about spoilers. So speak, so I guess, I guess I could ask you your favorite deity, but I'm, I'm, I'm guessing you're going to say the same as weapons that you love them all because you're, yeah, I mean, it's, they're like the, the character, like, it's weird. I can, I can, I can say this uh, as as someone with as someone with two kids. Like in real life, I, I do like think of characters I've worked on. It's they occupy like a similar uh, space in in my mind where I feel like like I feel like uh, protective around them. And and before our games are done, I feel like I have I have to like nurture them. Like it's my job to make sure that they don't die. It's similar to when you have like a very a small child. Um, uh, and 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 I love them. I love them a lot. Like I have to. If I don't love a character I'm working on, then then something is terribly wrong. Basically, then I have to I have to fix that. Um, so it, it's only sort of acceptable to me if I love the character. Um, that's the only way I can move forward with with the writing. Um, the, there are ones that like speak to me more than others. Like it's one of the big surprises for me on Hades is that, um, the, you know, we, we, we put some lighthearted stuff in there and it was intended to be our most lighthearted game, but if not for the early access process, I don't think I would have had as much like people think a lot of people have given us the feedback that they actually think it's funny. And I don't think of my self as like a as like a humor writer um even though all of our games have had like bits of humor in them but it's not been the prevailing sort of tone of it by any means but in this one there's more like kind of slapstick goofy stuff in there and and people have really enjoyed it so it's made me kind of keep keep doing it it's like hey if they don't if people aren't super pissed off about it they think it's good like oh i'm well i'm just gonna keep i'm gonna keep sort of pushing in that direction and and see what sticks um and uh, but but for me personally like the goofball characters they don't i don't relate to them as much myself because i'm not really like that i like our more like serious kind of moody characters are the ones who who maybe sp speak to me personally a little bit more but i love that the goofballs um are are kind of well well liked by others um we have characters like you know uh, skelly and dusa and stuff like that were characters that started off on the more kind of like humorous, ridiculous side of things. But but it's always, you know, the secret with any character, whether they're like a goofball or whether they're like 
like like a villainous character is is just to make the just to do something with them that makes them real um and then they like they have to still have motivations they have to still have opinions um about things and and then um and then i think that's your best chance of like players uh actually you know connecting with them and and liking them the way you said the the thing that you, the thing you said before is interesting that you you know you like everybody even though the, you're not kind of feel like you're not supposed to i did deliberately try to have a couple of characters in there that you're like man this guy's just a this guy's just a scumbag i just want to beat this guy up like if you <laughs> uh um and and there's like a, a there's electo also who's just like electo just kind of hates you and just says horrible things about you time after time no matter what you say she's she's just oh man she just calls you trash and is going to try to murder you um but yeah people you know end up liking them uh anyway because they're so motivated by how much right. they hate you even you know they still end up having they still end up being dedicated to what they do and when someone yeah it's back to the earlier point when someone like cares about their job even if that job is killing you the player you're like well i gotta give it up respect <laughs> yeah and and it and at some point you're kind of sad for like meg and, and her sisters because you're like you guys didn't stop me again um i guess i'll see you next time because like even to symphony um I, her lines i mean her lines are she's murder. she's one of those funny characters that's just like i'm gonna murder you and you're like again guys like can you just let me through this time i mean do we have to do this song and dance again but no they're like committed they're like no this is my job that hades gave me and if i don't do it there's going to be something worse than you know dying to you over and over again so it makes them lovable because they're like they're committed to their job it's like sorry yeah. this is what i got to do so it's it's hard to like theseus yeah i can see that he's kind of he's kind of a yeah he's you got theseus. him in the background there yeah He's a uh, bit. He takes a bit of. You, you mentioned Ken from Street Fighter. He's got a little bit of Ken in there, the <laughs> cocky uh, smirk and all that. He and really the BS does. Moves. Well, he's he's got a whole group of people like just cheering him on because they love yeah. him. And th and that's another one of the things that just the little touches when you know the crowd starts chanting for Zagreus, um, and you're like, oh, they love me now. And then yeah, so yeah. It, the little touches in the game that that I really enjoy. So. Quick question, because I know we, we only have a couple more minutes with you, Greg. Um, live service games are kind of a big thing now. But the, the more and more I think of like early access and the way you guys are developing in early access, it feels like it feels like yeah. live service to me. And it, it feels better than calling it live service because early access is, hey, we're building this, you're helping us. Like it, it's not gonna be perfect. We want your feedback. Um, and just kind of go on this journey with us. And that's yeah. where I feel like, you know, when when games say, hey, this is live service, that's kind of what I feel like it should be. But right now, live service is usually from from the point of us as consumers is you guys don't have enough for us, right? But when you call it early access, it's like, hey, we're helping you. Like, let's go on this journey journey together. Like, yeah, is that... I, I, I agree that like the, the kind of the positioning of it. So for us, it really, it's, it's not a I, I should be I should be clear like it's it's super it is as early access as it gets in the sense that like all the stuff that we've put in our updates we made it since the last update it's not like we're sitting on all this stuff and kind of rolling it <laughs> right. out every few months we're just like as soon as we finish one update we're like we we just start working on the next one and that's how long it takes us to to build all that stuff um but um there yeah like there there's some you know players have a lot of expectations for like big new games at this point and they're and that could be really tough for sure where it's like you know okay this was fine but you know where's my free updates until i'm 80 years old or whatever it's like right. well man like <laughs> what really is what's the contract between the game and the player especially if you're not like like if you're paying every month for world of warcraft or something like that that's one thing it's like you're you're literally paying for a service and you're entitled to some sort of service or something like that but if you if you buy a game, you play it for a hundred hours. I, I I don't know. I I'm not the sort of player personally who feels like I should I should get that game then supported indefinitely by the developer with with free content. But if the developer says that that's what they're going to do, well, okay, I'll take it. <laughs> um, yeah, and, yeah. and so I think developers, you know, they have a responsibility to to communicate clearly 
about what they're going to do and, you know, wh what lines they're going to draw and stuff like that. And I think with early access, one of our, one of the things, you know, we saw um, other developers doing successfully and we've really, really tried to do ourselves is just to like communicate as transparently as possible. We have a big, like our development roadmap, it isn't pretty in this, like some games have like a, actually a very pretty looking kind of graphical development roadmap. Ours is just a bunch of words that I, that I write uh, in addition to other words. And, but it, it, it's, it's pretty uh, thorough. I would like to think it tells you what we're working on, what's going to be in our next update. We've committed to exactly when our next updates are going to be um, and, and hit those dates. So we make those kind of promises, but we're careful to about which promises we make because we know that as a developer, if you if you break your promises, um, it can be a real bad time because um, trust is really hard to earn with your players and really easy to just sort of blow away, um, yeah. really hard to get back. So when we hear from folks like you saying they you know, they enjoyed Bastion or our previous games. We're so thankful for that. And we know that that stuff is like, it's just super fragile. So we, we just one, I always, it's just my own mindset. I, I feel like we're always just one small mistake away from blowing away all the, all the goodwill that we've spent 10 years, you know, building up or something like that. That's just my own kind of pessimism. Uh, but yeah, like early access is definitely, it, it's been a really different way of making games and it's going to be weird for us once we launch our version 1.0 and figure out what life looks like after after that, we're, as I mentioned, we're still figuring that out. I don't know that we'll like, early access has been so 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 productive and, and like good for us that I, at the moment, I find it hard to imagine that after this experience that we'll just like go back to like, well, now you won't hear from us for three years until right. we have a new game. But <laughs> especially since we've proven to ourselves, if not to others, that we can like, make early access work with the kind of game that we make like I, I think that people would have been skeptical that you can make a game with like a story and a bunch of speaking characters in an early access format but we, we've been able to do that and and even the story has benefited from that process in addition to everything else yeah and i think if you guys ever do make a misstep you slap uh, bind those keys on the front page of your website <laughs> say hey we did this remember yeah All remember this that we did. <laughs> hey, and, that's and I think uh, one of yeah. One of the great things that you guys have been doing for your team, Greg, that I don't know why more developers don't do this, is that you put your roadmap actually in the game where it's accessible yeah, yeah. in the game. And so many people don't, and they put it on Twitter or they put it on their websites. And I think I think developers sometimes just don't realize, like, you know, the majority of gamers aren't the type of people that, you know, are plugged in 24-7 like some of us are. Like the people that are plugged in, looking yeah. at forums, reading Reddit, we're kind of a small percentage of, of the player base out there. So you guys having that upfront saying, hey, this is what's coming. There's going to be an update in June. You know, this don't have big expectations because it's a lot of back end stuff that you guys are working on for that update. So I really, I, I, I'm a huge fan of Hades. I love, I love playing the game. I can't wait for more. Um, just because it's it's a fun game to play over and over again because it always feels like there's something new and there's something different. Like every run is different. It's not going to be the same thing unless somehow that lines up and you just pick the exact same thing over and over again, which would be weird. But um, I guess I just want to say, like, at the risk of sounding like a fanboy, like, thanks for all the hard work you and your team are doing. Oh, thank you. Because yeah. you've put out, you know, titles that have made an impact on me and my kids and that's you know that's not something that's easy to do is to you know brit you know to span that gap from younger gamers to older people you know and you know think i i hope the team realizes how how uh how important your guys' games are to a lot of people out there well th th thank you very much no it means it means a lot and and the um and we want our games to that like generation spanning quality you mentioned that's something that's like really my a lot of my favorite things have that quality where like a lot of the stuff i you know i'm i'm in my i'm i'm over 40 but a lot of my favorite things are like things you know that i liked as a kid or whatever still like i i still have like fond fond memories of them or stuff like that um still like cartoons and whatever else it's 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 great when a story can have a universal quality um that 
that you know whether you're 12 or 50 or whatever you can you can find something to like in it and and i i i've always like games were sort of like powerful to me since i was my my first experience of games being like super impactful was probably when i was around like eight years old playing an old uh computer role-playing game called ultima 4 um and and it was like you know it was kind of like the the skyrim or something of its time it was just like oh my god like you could do anything it was a it was like a mind mind altering experience so i i've always known about the power of games and for us it's like could we ever make something that could have that effect on someone else and so hearing that it can um really means a lot and we're in an incredibly fortunate position to be able to make the kind of games that we want to make on our own terms with with people we like and respect so for us it's just the hard work is like the anteing up at the table of this thing it's just like this is it, it, it would it would be we 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 should just keep doing this for as, as long as we can uh, because it's so not, not everyone is so lucky to be able to have a shot at it at all so that's a, that's how i feel about it anyway so i'm i'm really glad that it's it's had that effect on you because for me it's it's i'm doing the kind of I have no aspirations of doing some other type of work at any point. Like when I'm working on these stories and these characters, you know, whatever, writing Theseus, having Theseus say terrible things to you, that's like, that's all I want to do. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, and then, and then make him actually say those things. Again. So yeah. that's, that's the life for me. Um, and, it, and I, I hope we can stick together and keep doing this for, for a long time to come. Yeah. Whatever other ideas we may come up with uh, down the line. But yeah, th thanks so much. Yeah, keep keep letting us know how we're doing also because that's been, you can see from our patch notes that we take that stuff seriously. It's like half half the, practically half the stuff yep. we do is like uh, from, uh, based on suggestions that come from our community. So it's really yeah. important. You guys have a very uh, active Discord that you take a lot of yeah. suggestions and feedback from. Um, I think recently you guys have been pulling, pulling translators from the Discord to help out with yeah. um, some localization. So cool stuff going on there. But, and Craig, Greg, uh, before you leave, do you want to tell people where they can find you if they want to talk to you on? Um, where can they find you online if they if they have feedback? Oh yeah, uh, I'm I'm my own Twitter is just uh, my last name Kasavin K A S A V I N and. Um, uh, and we're also at Supergiant Games on Twitter and Facebook and and just Supergiant on Discord. Um, I run our Twitter. So whether you contact me personally or write to our uh, Supergiant Games Twitter, we're, we're pretty, we, we love talking to people um, on, yeah, like hear, hearing what people think and all that. Um, so yeah, hit, hit me up. I like, you know, Twitter is one of those things that cuts both ways, right? But if you, if you just like, I just follow people who are into, awesome stuff that I care about and that they care about. Twitter is just, what I love about Twitter is you could like take one of your favorite things, find someone who worked on it and tell them like, man, thank you for that thing. It's awesome. Yeah. That's what I, that's like what I use Twitter for. And sometimes they'll just like the tweet. Sometimes they won't do anything. Sometimes they'll respond. It's like, it's an amazing world when you can like write to the person who worked on one of your favorite things in the world. And they'll just like, they could be all the way across the world and they'll get back to you. I, that never ceases to, to amaze me. I do that myself like pretty frequently. It's fun. So yeah, it, it never hurts to ask. And, and right now I believe Hades is on sale for 20% off on steam. It, it, it is indeed uh, coincidentally um, it, as yeah, it's the weekend deal on, on steam right now. So it's a, it's, if, if you were so inclined, it's a, it's a good time to pick it up. We've said, we're not going to like, we're, we're neither going to raise or uh, lower the price as far as we're concerned when, when the game exits early access. So if you see yourself playing it any time in the nearer future, uh, you're unlikely to get uh, a better deal than the, than the current one uh, for, for some time. I would, I would say that. Well, Greg, thank you so yeah. much for joining us. Hopefully we can do this in the future sometime, uh, maybe yeah. after the game releases and we can um yeah we can talk more about how everything's going and hopefully hopefully it'll be during um more uh better times in the world so. yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah no no thank you guys i hope i hope you all are doing well yeah Th yeah thanks again for having me yeah thank well, you thanks, greg hopefully you and your family are have a good have a good night thanks you too bye
Thank you so much. Let's see. Yeah.